Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about a number of diseases today that on the surface might not appear to be related at all. I mean, what does heart disease have to do with Parkinson's disease? So I'm going to tell you why, what our hypothesis and others in the country feel that uh, these are all due to a lack of blood flow, lack of blood flow to a tissue or an organ. Okay, I'm going to talk about angiogenesis. That's the growth of new blood vessels in our bodies. Um, and we believe that leads to, we know it leads to heart disease, but newer evidence also shows that it uh, leads to a number of these neurodegenerative diseases, such as Parkinson's uh, and Alzheimer's. And I'll show you uh, some of the evidence for that. <clears throat> okay, so angiogenesis is simply, uh, you know, I'm going to point at this. Can you see this? Okay. Simply the growth of new blood vessels. You can see this is a wound uh, looking like under the scab area of that wound. You can see these tiny little tendrils of new blood vessels. And these are regenerating the skin tissue uh, in this wound area. That includes the skin cells, uh, nerve cells, hair follicles, what, whatever you need to regenerate healthy skin. Uh, angiogenesis is, is uh, stimulating that. Now, in these diseases, though, uh, <clears throat> these chronic diseases, such as heart disease and Parkinson's, uh, angiogenesis is not occurring as it should, so we need to give it a boost. And that's called uh, therapeutic angiogenesis, okay? This is where we're injecting our drug uh, into the heart. I'll show you a clinical trial injecting this drug into the heart. Uh, and for Parkinson's and uh, ALS, we're infusing it uh, intravenously. But with therapeutic angiogenesis, think of this as a blood vessel in the diseased heart where you're not getting enough blood flow into someone with coronary artery disease. I'm going to show you by injecting this drug, you can get a situation that looks like this after about three months. Okay? And these patients do better. They have less angina. And uh, so this is what we're developing in the heart. Over 75 human diseases are a result of this impaired blood perfusion. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all 75, but we're looking at a number of them. And really, blood perfusion in our bodies is really all that matters. We need blood perfusion to, to get nutrients, uh, oxygen to our tissues, and more importantly, or as importantly, to remove uh, waste products. Uh, all our cells metabolize, uh, generate waste products. and if they're not removed, you can have toxic uh, situations. And we'll see this in the brain, especially where uh, amyloid, beta amyloid, toxic proteins build up in the brain, some people with Alzheimer's, and also in Parkinson's disease, uh, there's a buildup of toxic matters that should be normally swept away uh, by uh, a blood perfusion system, which is impaired in these diseases. All right, you've got 60,000 miles of blood vessels in your body, uh, enough to go around the world three, almost three times. Uh, and again, they're supplying each of the tissues and organs uh, with nutrients, oxygen. Uh, and these blood vessels don't all look the same in different tissues. They really adapt uh, to what our body needs. And let me just show you some examples of that. Uh, so these are blood vessels in different tissues. These are blood vessels in the liver where they're adapted to kind of exchange uh, toxins out of the blood, purify the blood. In the lung here, you can see the blood vessels are uh, maximized to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide in, in, as we breathe and exhale. Nerves in the brain. Uh, these are kind of interesting in the muscle. They're corkscrew uh, blood vessels, let's say if we're running our muscles are contracting. We don't want our vessels to get kinked, so they, this allows them to kind of go back and forth in a spring-like action in the muscles. Okay, so angiogenesis is the growth of these vessels uh, in tissues, and you can have diseases which are a result of insufficient angiogenesis. Uh, we know stroke, heart disease, these account for over 50% of deaths in the world, okay? So these, these are important diseases. Uh, <clears throat> excessive angiogenesis is also bad, and I think 
probably the most well-known example of excessive angiogenesis is in cancer, where tumor cells, very metabolically active, need an extra boost of blood supply. So they create uh, their own blood supply by excessive angiogenesis. And there are drugs now that are being used, newer drugs, uh, which can attack uh, this excessive angiogenesis in cancer and have shown uh, some effectiveness in, <clears throat> in that disease. So what I'll talk about today are these uh, diseases. We're going to start at the bottom with our feet uh, and how angiogenesis can be used to look at uh, these diabetic foot ulcers, uh, peripheral artery disease, uh, leg ulcers. And then we'll move up into the heart, and I'll show you some clinical trial data in our uh, in uh, heart studies, people with coronary artery disease. And then I'll finish up with uh, <clears throat> work mainly up to now in animals uh, in the brain, looking at stroke in the brain, uh, neurodegenerative diseases. But we are beginning a clinical trial uh, with Parkinson's disease here in the U.S., uh, as well as uh, ALS, which is Lou Gehrig's disease. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about our drug, what we're developing. Uh, as Dan mentioned, it's FGF1. Uh, it's a natural protein. We all have it in our bodies. Uh, it's a very potent stimulator, probably the most potent stimulator of angiogenesis in our bodies. Uh, I was involved in purifying this when I was a couple years ago when I was a graduate student uh, in St. Louis. Uh, we got it from cow brains, lots and lots of cow brains. Uh, it's very abundant in the brains. Uh, but in our clinical trials, we're not using cow FGF1. We use human uh, FGF1, FGF1, which we've uh, bioengineered. This is recombinant DNA technology. We make it in factories uh, according to FDA standards. So the FGF1 we're using now is pure, potent, and uh, acceptable for human use. So let's talk about some of the uses of this drug in stimulating angiogenesis uh, in a number of human diseases. Uh, in phase two FDA authorized trials, we tested this in um, diabetic foot ulcers, where this stimulates wound healing by stimulating uh, angiogenesis. So these foot ulcers are shown here, uh, about 5 to 10 percent of patients with diabetes develop these uh, nasty chronic uh, wounds, basically. Uh, they don't heal. Uh, they can become infected, uh, and the foot becomes, uh, can develop gangrene, and uh, kind of the most feared complication of this whole process is an amputation, where you uh, lose that um, foot or leg and with a two-year life expectancy. So. To treat these ulcers while they're there and non-infected is, is very important. So we're putting this drug that we've uh, developed, FGF1, directly into the uh, wound bed. And let me show you some of the results uh, in clinical trials. <clears throat> Before you do it in humans, you've got to test it in uh, animals. So we have diabetic mice uh, that run around the lab. And we can give these mice uh, wounds. And then we start treating them with FGF1, just putting drops of FGF1 at these different days. And you can see after 15 days, uh, this wound that is treated here with FGF1 is, is significantly more closed than the untreated wound. So with data like this, we submit this to the FDA and begin our human trial. And let me just show you some human examples before I give you the results. This is uh, in a phase two trial, treating these are human uh, diabetic foot ulcers. This is three weeks before any treatment begins. And then treating with FGF1, you can see here slowly we get healing. These are healed. Uh, Non-treated wounds stay open for a period of five months. So these are healing after about uh, three to four months. So you can actually measure this acceleration of wound healing. This versus this. You can see this is a graph that we... Uh, where we show the FGF1 treated wounds heal about five times faster versus the placebo group. Okay. Back to you. Is that current treatment? Is that what that is? 
that is a standard of care where they get wound, proper wound hand, you know, care, cleaning the wound, but they don't get another drug in, the, in, that, in that case. <clears throat> yeah, feel f- free to interrupt if you have any questions or something's not clear. Uh, so, yeah, let me show you the next slide. Here's the uh, completed trial uh, where this is for five months uh, we treat. Uh, this is the placebo group. This is the FGF1 treaty group. Uh, you can see after about trials five months here, 100% of the wounds are closed with this treatment with this drug, where th- about 35% of the placebo-treated wounds stay open. Uh, this was a group of 40 patients. So, cost it cost about about 15 to 20 thousand dollars per patient. So that would be well, 40 times. Yeah, it's about one to two million. But a phase three trial would have to be much much larger than this. But even with 40 patients, it was statistically significant. So that that's a good that's a good result. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is here, about eight weeks, none of the placebo-treated wounds have healed, where almost 50% of the FGF1-treated uh, wounds have healed. So uh, this is a good result. We uh, Third parties have uh, been following us. This is a major unmet medical need, diabetic wounds. Uh, it's a very large market. And... If our drug could be approved, it would be a wound healing drug that will impact the market, according to these uh, analysts. So, now, and this is topical, another uh, topical use of the drug. Another t- topical use of the drug is healing uh, venous leg ulcers, okay? So what is a venous leg ulcer? These are very painful, larger wounds that you get on your legs, again, due to uh, insufficient blood flow to that region of the skin. <clears throat> Lots of venous ulcers uh, in the world. And uh, again, we can put the FGF1 topically on this uh, venous ulcer. And in a period of weeks, we see uh, healing rates in the treated ulcers that are about twice over the placebo treated ulcers. So. Uh, it's like a honey-like consistency, so it's a dropper. So you drop it on the wound, and then you cover it with an occlusive type of wound bandage, and this, they get treated every other day. So this can be done at home. So we bring them into the clinic, we treat them in the clinic, and then give them some home drug to do at home. So uh, a gel, yeah, gel could be also developed, but we've chosen to, to keep it as a liquid, liquid formulation. Okay, let's uh, move up into the heart. <clears throat> Again, there's phase two data injecting, this time injecting the growth factor right into the wall of the heart, heart muscle. And these are in patients with uh, severe coronary artery disease. I'm going to show you a short video clip. Actually, ABC News came in and to one of our clinic sites and interviewed the patients who were treated and put together a nice uh, piece on that. Let me just show you, though, what it looks like uh, in the heart. This is a human heart. Uh, This is an angiogram. So this is a coronary artery filled with a dye. Uh, And this is in a diseased heart. You can see large areas that are not vascularized. There's no blood vessels going in here. This produces angina. These people can't do well on a treadmill test. So we inject the growth factor directly into the heart muscle. And three months later, you get something which looks like this. This is a blush work of new vessels uh, growing. This is in three dimensions. It would be growing directly into the heart muscle. And if you do this all around the heart where it's damaged, you can get very uh, remarkably increased blood flow into the damaged heart, such that these people feel a lot better, less uh, angina, uh, do better on a treadmill. Uh, let me show you this video clip. So this was one of our sites in, in Cincinnati where uh, a number of patients were treated. Uh, and you can kind of see some of the results here. Arteries, his pain is gone. I really feel great. 
Duke was one of the first heart patients in the country to be treated with a protein actually There's capable of growing brand new arteries. The genetically engineered protein is injected directly into the heart. Within days, a network of new vessels begins to grow around the blockage, increasing the blood supply. Dr. Lynn Wagner showed us the changes in one patient's heart. We see a small, narrow main artery and not very many secondary and tertiary arteries. This is after the treatment. What we're now seeing see is new blood vessels right growing here uh, off the, the end of this artery. And the patients themselves? Symptomatically, they're improved within a couple of weeks of the treatment. Just ask Constance Donnelly. Oh, I feel wonderful. I've never felt so good in the last five years. But doctors already see potential in other cases where the blood supply needs a boost, such as strokes and diabetes. Okay, so uh, that woman you saw there, Constance Donnelly, she was a cardiac cripple. You can see she was up and walking about. Uh, she probably responded the best in the entire clinical trial. She was the most severely affected. Uh, but really responded the best. And she, we had three dosing groups in this trial, low, middle, and high dosing. She was in the lowest dosing group. So it kind of shows that her heart was primed uh, to respond. And we kind of did an artist rendition of what we thought was going on inside Constance's heart, that she had severe heart disease. Uh, she needed new blood vessels. And her body uh, was trying to respond. These are uh, schematic. These are the FGF1 receptors. These are. The, this is the FGF1 drug. So to get new blood vessels, you need to have drug occupying all these receptors to stimulate new blood vessel growth. So her heart was primed to respond to FGF1, and when we introduced it, kind of like an explosion of new blood vessels in her heart, leading to her uh, remarkable uh, progress uh, after uh, three months after the treatment. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's talk about something similar to uh, clogged arteries in the heart. We'll talk about clogged arteries in the legs. This is peripheral artery disease, a very similar situation to heart disease, but occurring uh, in the legs. You get these blockages in major uh, arteries in the legs, and that leads to uh, pain, uh, two types. You get the less severe form, it's called claudication, uh, where you have pain upon walking. Uh, the more severe form is critical limb ischemia, uh, where you have pain all the time in your legs, again, due to these blocked arteries uh, in the legs. Uh, this again leads to uh, lower limb amputations as the, as the final most severe complication of this disease. <clears throat> And just like in the heart, you can do angiograms on the legs of these patients. And <clears throat> so this is, these are leg arteries. This is a normal individual. This is the knee, level of the knee. You can see nice blood flow filling these arteries. Someone with PAD, uh, one, leg, one leg is affected, this leg is affected. So look here, right at this level, these are filled with blood. These are blocked completely. So these muscles are not getting nearly enough blood perfusion. Up here you can see another blockage versus normal. So we inject, uh, we'll be injecting the growth factor directly into the muscle. We don't have to do it heart, we don't have to open up the person or do it, uh, go inside. We can directly inject uh, right into the legs uh, to stimulate new blood vessel growth there. <clears throat> Uh, we've done this in animals. Um, you can do the same thing in animals. You can remove, this is a rabbit uh, leg. You can remove arteries in that leg of the rabbit and inject FGF1 directly into the muscle of the rabbit. And it's kind of hard to see, but this is before treatment. After treatment, these rabbit legs look much more vascularized. These are new blood vessels right here. Uh, again, these the little pinpricks here are blood vessels. Uh, before, you can see after treatment, you have many more vessels in that rabbit leg. And that leads to much better perfusion. So here is uh, blood perfusion in the leg of the animals that were treated with FGF1, uh, no treatment. So these rabbits are doing much better. They're hopping around their cages, happy, and uh, we'll be doing a similar type of study in people. Uh, 
No, no, no. We inject uh, with these animals. It was done, yeah, you know, one, two, three, six times, and then people will be doing more uh, over a longer period of time. Uh, well, it depends on how much ischemia pathology is in the leg. So we would inject, uh, here we would inject probably in the upper leg as well as kind of in a spiral going down the lower leg, and we do that over a period of a couple months. Okay. We're going to move up into, I'm sorry, it's a protein, so it's like growth hormone or insulin in your body. Uh, and, yeah, so many, many drugs are proteins, so they tend to get injected. Uh, uh, it's not for sale yet. You've got to, uh, <laughs> we've got to get an FDA approved first. So we have to do these, these trials. You do phase one, phase two, and then phase three trials before approval. So we're on some of these in the middle. So the things we look for in our clinical trials that the FDA has asked us is uh, we look in the eyes because your retina is very sensitive to extra blood vessel growth. Yeah, you can get leaky vessels in your retina and that can cause blindness, so we look at that very carefully. I uh, haven't seen any effects in the eyes. Uh, also, they worry about cancer because it's a very potent growth factor. So we measure tumor markers. Uh, so FGF1 does it in animals and in people. It's never been shown to cause a tumor, but if an animal has a tumor already growing, this is going to stimulate the growth of that. So we check very carefully that none of the patients entering these trials have any type of, of active cancer. What's the best way to identify symptoms in individuals before you have the Are you saying using it in a preventative way or? Right. Well, we do, I mean, we do eye exams before they're treated. Uh, we do, I mean, we look to outside uh, oncologists to tell us whether there's any history of cancer. Uh, but we don't really do any diagnosing of these other things, yeah. But we follow them throughout the trial, though. So we look at the eyes maybe every two or three weeks. We measure tumor markers every two or three weeks. And then over a five-month trial, we get a picture of what's going on. Yeah. Uh, you, it can be done by a, a, an angiogram. So they put a dye into your leg arteries. I showed you that. The, the, or you just have pain on walking. I mean, it can be physical pain, but they can diagnose it with uh, numbness. Now, numbness is generally due to, it can, it can be due to a vascular issue. But that's like peripheral neuropathy is what you're ta referring to. That can be uh, a diabetic complication. This is more blockage, blockage of the vessels. And it, yeah. So what's the Right. So once you inject it, uh, most of it, 90% of the drug is cleared within about one hour. Uh, in the muscle or in the legs here, uh, it stays resident for approximately three to five days. It's bound up, and then it dissipates. So that's why we inject every three or so days in, these, in this. But it doesn't, it's not, there's not uncontrolled blood vessel growth forever. So it definitely has a stopping point. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to show you some, some data f uh, in older people, okay? Older people with blockages, yeah. So we'll get to that, okay? There's a little, actually a little video that we didn't do, but it was done at Columbia University in New York, and uh, looking at uh, as we age, as our brain ages, a lack of blood flow to our brains causes 
the cognitive decline we all see you know, as we get older. We forget where our car keys are, forget names. They think that's a, a blood, bus, uh, blood perfusion issue as well. Yes? They are. So in that heart trial, we looked three years later, and the, the vessels were there. They're durable. Uh, we didn't look past three years, but a lot of these patients are living uh, a lot longer. So um, we think we're growing new and durable uh, blood vessels. Okay, let's look into the brain. Uh, so your brain is probably the most vascularized uh, organ in your body. Uh, <clears throat> billions of neurons uh, that need a constant supply of blood. Uh, again, nutrients, oxygen, glucose, uh, removing uh, metabolic waste products. So let me, I just want to introduce a term. It's called the neurovascular unit. This has come into vogue recently. Uh, and it just refers to the interaction between the blood uh, the blood system and our neuro nerve cells in our brains. Uh, here's larger arteries in the brain giving rise to smaller arterioles, uh, the capillaries. So here's a neuron in your brain. Basically every neuron in our brain has a dedicated capillary. This is the capillary right here, you know, filled with blood, giving this neuron uh, nutrients, taking away waste products. And if this breaks down or gets clogged, uh, these neurons are going to suffer. So in Parkinson's disease, this is occurring in a very small area of the brain. Uh, it's called the substantia nigra region of the brain. Uh, in Alzheimer's, we believe the breakdown of the vascul vasculature is occurring more globally throughout the brain. And I'll show you some uh, data on that. The second concept I want to keep in mind is also in our brain, we have what are called stem cells, neural stem cells. Uh, 15 years ago, people didn't think these existed. They thought we were born with all the brain cells we were ever going to have, but that is not true. We have these stem cells, actually pools, pools of stem cells in our brain uh, that spring into action when our brain is injured. But they need adequate blood supply to divide and, more importantly, to mature. So these stem cells can mature into neurons or these are supporting cells in our brains, different cell types that are kind of basically help the neurons. So these stem cells can give rise to all the cells that are needed for healthy brain tissue. But if there's not adequate blood flow, this is not going to happen. So again, increasing blood flow, blood perfusion to the brain can stimulate what's called neurogenesis. So uh, regeneration of healthy brain tissue uh, from these stem cells. So let's look at some uh, medical indications where this might be useful. Uh, in stroke, we, uh, I'll show you some animal data. But as you know, a stroke is from uh, a blood clot either in an artery leading into the brain or can occur in an artery uh, already in the brain, inside the brain. <clears throat> Here's a stroke. You get an area of infarcted, dead uh, nervous tissue. Uh, you get a core, uh, the core is surrounded by what's called the penumbra, which is cells that are at risk uh, and that will eventually die if they don't uh, get a proper blood supply uh, <clears throat> resupplied. So that's what our drug is doing in these animal models I'll show you is stimulating new blood vessel growth to kind of help heal this, this area. So let me show you the brain of a rat. Uh, you don't want to be a laboratory rat at any point in your career. So uh, <clears throat> these are slices of, 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 of the brain, going through the brain, in an animal given a stroke. Uh, the white areas is the stroke volume, the core, the infarcted areas it's called. And then treating for three weeks with FGF1, uh, this is given intravenously. You can see here uh, much less of the stroke volume. <clears throat> and actually repopulation of areas of the brain with uh, new blood vessels and new neurons. We actually can look at the vessels uh, in these animals. And let's look at the, the actual vessels. So these are the capillaries in the normal brain. 
We give the animals a stroke. You see you get a complete wiping out of those small capillaries in the area of the stroke. This would be in that penumbra area. Uh, and here, this is important, we treat, <clears throat> this is after uh, two weeks, you can see the uh, recovery in the FGF1 treated animals. These are new blood vessels growing. Not quite as good as here, but much, much better uh, than here. And these are the untreated animals. You do get regrowth of blood vessels as shown here, but the vessels are tangled, they're disordered, and we can do motor skill testing on these rats. So the rats with a brain like this are doing much better than animals that have uh, not been treated with FGF1. So this is now ready to go into people. Uh, we're finishing up some toxicity studies to make sure we're not doing anything nasty in the brains of animals before we uh, go into humans. Yes? Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, traumatic brain injury, you know, especially with severe, like in a car accident, you really basically end up with areas like that. So it's one of the uh, indications that's on our list. We're not doing it right now, but certainly it would be that. And you refer to the, the athletes, they get, you know, this chronic traumatic encephalopathy, is CTE. We think it's the same thing. You're Constant hand injuries uh, gives rise to. I'm sorry. So for the brain, <clears throat> if you give it into an artery in your arm, about one to four percent gets into the brain. So we're lucky that it gets across the blood-brain barrier. Small, small amount, but enough to show uh, efficacy in these in the animal models. Okay, let's talk about <clears throat> some neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, and this is going to be work not only that we've done, but really from a large number of hospitals and medical centers around the country. Uh, Alzheimer's. Uh, healthy brain, uh, advanced Alzheimer's. I think you can see clearly loss of tissue, loss of neurons. Uh, people are familiar with the symptoms <clears throat> and studies done uh, actually up in Montreal, McGill University, they did probably one of the largest studies to date. They looked, they followed over a thousand patients with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, they looked at 78 regions of the brain, so thousands and thousands of images in the study. <clears throat> and they were looking what happened, <clears throat> excuse me, what happens over time in someone with Alzheimer's? What happens in early Alzheimer's? What happens in later Alzheimer's? And they looked at such things as blood flow. Uh, they looked at neuronal activities. They looked at the accumulation of this beta amyloid, which is this toxic protein. So what did they find uh, remarkably in our estimation? So this is early Alzheimer's progressing to, this is late onset Alzheimer's. The very first thing that occurs in these patients with Alzheimer's is a vascular change. This is vascular abnormalities. So these people are first symptom before they get cognitive decline, before they get the beta amyloid in their brains, they're losing blood vessels. They're having a lack of blood flow. So if we can treat these patients early on, uh, before the cognitive decline, before <clears throat> beta amyloid appears, we feel we have a hope of perhaps uh, slowing down this disease by increasing blood perfusion in the brains of these patients. So again, that'll be something which is a high priority uh, that we'll be pursuing. Our first is gonna be in Parkinson's disease, but this is certainly uh, of high priority. <clears throat> Another neurodegenerative disease is multiple sclerosis. Uh, Again, this disease is caused by lesions in nerve fibers in the spine or even in the brain. <clears throat> so you get a lesion and distal to that lesion, you can get pain, numbness, uh, motor skill problems. We know with uh, MS, 
the body, our own bodies attack our nerves in these lesions. So in these lesions you get uh, antibodies, our own immune system attacking this outer sheath. So this is a protective sheath for each nerve. It's called the myelin sheath. <clears throat> When the antibodies attack it, you damage it, and this leads to the lesion uh, seen in multiple uh, sclerosis. Recent work, uh, not by us, but by uh, other medical centers, have shown that dysfunctional blood vessels are the cause why these immune cells can get out of the blood vessels and attack uh, the nerves in MS, in these lesions. So, here we see a norm, normal, healthy blood vessel. Uh, no immune cells escaping, healthy neuron. But through a process that's not quite understood yet, but genes, smoking, lack of vitamin D, maybe pathogens leads to uh, multiple sclerosis. <clears throat> you get damaged blood vessels then in the multiple MS lesions, uh, and you get leakage out of these damaged blood vessels of these immune cells, which can attack these neurons leading, leading to MS. So again, <clears throat> a vascular dysfunction in MS, a drug which could heal dysfunctional blood vessels or even grow new blood vessels, is certainly worth testing in this, in this uh, degenerative disease. Yeah, this, is, this would be in the central nervous system, this would be in the lesions. So you get, <clears throat> in MS, you get a lesion in, either in the spinal cord or in the brain. Uh, ALS, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. <clears throat> this is uh, another neurodegenerative disease which has a very rapid, uh, rapidly progression. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, in animal models of this disease, uh, again, we see disordered uh, capillaries. This is in the spinal cord. These are normal mice. These are capillaries. This is ALS mice. You can see, again, vascular dysfunction, vascular disorder uh, in these animals. So what is thought in uh, Lou Gehrig's disease is that low growth factors, such as this one, or FGF1 lead to uh, impaired neural blood perfusion, leading to ischemia, much as we see in the heart, uh, leading to dysfunctional motor neurons in this disease. And again, if we can introduce a agent which can increase vascularization in the brain, uh, possibly reversing uh, this disease. This thing stimulates new blood vessel growth, much like ours does. Uh, it's mainly smaller vessels. The FGF1 that we're working with can do both smaller vessels and small arteries. Uh, this has been tested in humans. Uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, this VEGF protein cannot cross the blood-brain barrier, so they had to give it directly into the brains of patients with ALS. This was done in Europe. Uh, they had to drill and uh, put in a injection port into the brain, and unfortunately the trial was halted due to infection, uh, which was seen. Um, we will be doing again the intravenous injection with the FGF1 and feel it's a more attractive candidate because of this. <clears throat> okay, Parkinson's disease. This is probably where we're most furthest along, uh, have an application into the uh, FDA and also are thinking about doing trials outside of the U.S. Uh, Parkinson's disease uh, occurs, affects mainly neurons in this very tiny region of the midbrain, deep in our brains, it's called the substantia nigra region of the brain. <clears throat> and these dopamine producing cells, which control uh, motor, our motor skills, our uh, movement, uh, start dying off. Uh, and so these dopamine cells which control movement in Parkinson's become affected, uh, less dopamine, uh, less movement. And it's now known uh, using MRI technology. You can use MRI to look very carefully at blood perfusion in the brains of, of patients with, with uh, Parkinson's. Uh, 
<clears throat> these are studies not done by us, but by outside medical groups. Using MRI to look at blood perfusion in healthy adults, here's a 20-year-old, 100% kind of maximal blood perfusion. As we get older, someone asks a question about aging. Uh, these are healthy 65-year-old, about 25% less blood flow. And they were looking, in this study, they were looking in the area that's affected in Parkinson's disease, uh, deep in the midbrain area. <clears throat> Uh, remarkably, with Parkinson's, you get about a 50% reduction in blood flow in that region of the brain where the dopamine-producing uh, neurons are. Uh, and this is some with a stroke in that region. You can see almost a complete blockage there. So this is affecting, in Parkinson's, blood perfusion is affecting these dopamine-producing cells. Uh, it also, in Parkinson's disease, you can get other areas of the brain which are affected. Um, <clears throat> this is again the same MRI functional scan looking kind of the cortex of the brain, the, the, the regions, the big globes of our brain that are uh, involved in executive functioning, memory. So people with Park <clears throat> Parkinson's can get dementia and here's a scan. This is a, a blood perfusion scan of a Parkinson's patient with dementia. <clears throat> the blue is normal blood flow, uh, yellow is reduced, and then red is really dramatically reduced blood flow. And this patient has dramatically reduced blood flow in those regions of the brain which control uh, memory, uh, executive functioning, and she <clears throat> leading to her dementia. So if we treated a patient like this with our FGF1, we would expect not only to increase blood flow where the dopamine producing neurons are, but also to help with increased uh, blood vessel growth in these areas that are affected. Uh, we've looked at our drug, FGF1, in two animal models. Uh, there are two animal models of Parkinson's disease, one in rats and one in monkeys. <clears throat> and you look basically at, uh, you give these animals Parkinson's disease with a toxin. They develop all the classic symptoms of Parkinson's. And then you do motor skill testing after you give them uh, the FGF1. So here's an example. Uh, our drug FGF1 given to uh, rats with experimental Parkinson's. You can see these, these are normal kind of motor skill tests, through different types of testing on the animals. With Parkinson's disease, uh, they lose significant motor activity. And those treated with FGF1 regain back, not, not all, but significant, a significant amount of motor skill activity. And if you look in these rats, if you look in their brains, again, you don't want to be a rat, but we look in their brains, and you can see uh, new dopamine-producing neurons in those, the brains of those animals. So these are no FGF1, and you can see richly kind of bright staining. Uh, these are new dopamine-producing neurons in the brain. So this is getting at the root cause of Parkinson's, the, the death of these dopamine-producing cells. Uh, kind of the gold standard in Parkinson's is a monkey model of Parkinson's, uh, <clears throat> which we've studied, which FGF1 has been studied in. This is a much more uh, chronic model where you inject this toxin. This is months now, so this is going on over, uh, almost two years. You inject this toxin into the monkey's brain. And over a period of nine months, you can see these are motor skills. These monkeys come down with all the classical symptoms of Parkinson's disease, the tremor, the gait problems. If we start treating with FGF1 here after 10 months, uh, these are untreated animals, treated animals. You can see these animals are doing much better than the uh, untreated animals in terms of regaining motor skills, about 80% of normal now, not completely back to normal, but about 80%. Again, if we look at the end of the experiments in the brains of these monkeys, we look for the dopamine producing cells. Again, as similar as in the rats, uh, we can see new dopamine producing neurons in these monkeys, which we believe directly correlates with their better motor functions. So again, this, again, we believe is attacking the root cause of Parkinson's. Uh, it is stimulating new uh, dopamine-producing cells in those animals. <clears throat> you 
Now, I mentioned <clears throat> that in some of these diseases, you get accumulation of a toxic protein, which can also lead to the pathology. In Alzheimer's, it's the beta amyloid. Uh, in Parkinson's, it's another protein. <clears throat> it's called aggregated alpha-synuclein. So here, here is in those monkeys, in their brains, they get this aggregated toxic protein. And a similar phenomenon is seen in uh, Alzheimer's. Normal animals don't have much of that. And you can see with the FGF1 treatment, you can significantly reduce the amount of this toxic uh, protein in the brains of these monkeys. Again, we believe contributing to the beneficial effect of FGF1 treatment in Parkinson's. So we're, we're ready to go with this into people. I mean, uh, I'll show you what the clinical trial is going to look like. Uh, but before I do that, let me just show you work by number, <clears throat> numbers of medical centers throughout the world have shown a, a microvascular component in all these brain disorders. Uh, uh, and I've talked about a number of these, Parkinson's, ALS, MS, Alzheimer's, chronic stroke, TBI, someone asked me about traumatic brain injury. Post-traumatic stress disorder, this is what a lot of the military veterans come back with after having uh, chronic or multiple concussions. MSA is a particularly nasty form of Parkinson's, where, which is much more rapidly progressing. Uh, chronic depression, vascular dementia, and this is this disease that the NFL football players come down with, uh, CTE. So we <clears throat> are going to start clinical trials, hopefully in all these indications, not, not all at once. We're going to start off with Parkinson's and ALS uh, in what the FDA has approved is we can look at three different doses in Parkinson's disease. No placebo group, so everyone who, who's in the trial will get the drug, which is good. You don't have to do blinded placebo trials to phase two. Uh, we'll look for both safety of our drug in Parkinson's disease patients as well as any improvement in, in motor skill testing. Uh, and people will be in the trial for approximately one year looking at safety uh, and efficacy. So finally, let me end on one last thing. Uh, someone asked me about aging, just regular aging in healthy people. No diseases, uh, just getting old. Uh, and let me just remind you, this is what I showed you. Blood perfusion in the brain between a healthy 21-year-old and a healthy 65-year-old. So there's lack of blood flow. So let me show you a short video uh, from Time Life that did a piece on a study that came out of Columbia University Medical Center in, in New York talking about this a lack of blood flow uh, as we age and what it let, <clears throat> led to. So this is a study out of Columbia, why our brains perform worse as we age. They looked at 28 healthy people who had died suddenly of accidents. So these are all healthy individuals. <clears throat> uh, ranging age from 14 years to 80 years. Uh, they looked at brain cells in different parts of the brain. Uh, they're focused more on the memory cells, uh, memory parts of the brain, looking at new neurons, so basically stem cells in those areas of the brains. They found that older people make it as many uh, new neurons in that part of the brain, but what is different in the aging brain is reduced blood flow to nourish these cells. So in older people, uh, they're dividing less and generating fewer new neurons than in these younger people. So in older individuals, that pool of stem cells is there, but it's just not as active. You can't form as many new neurons as we get older. So these researchers suggested that it may be possible to combat age-related uh, cognitive decline if we're able to improve uh, blood flow to the brain. 
So we could not agree more uh, with them. And uh, we're going to be, we have a booth here if you want to learn more about the clinical trials or want more information about the company, please stop by. Uh, and I'll take any more questions. Yeah. <clears throat>